Hello, everyone, and welcome to Seriously Loco, the Seriously Crazy Fan Podcast for El Paso Locomotive FC. I am your host, Phil Baki, and I'm joined tonight by my co-host, Mika Burrell. Mika, how uh, how was how was the weekend? The weekend was good. Um, happy belated Father's Day to you, Phil, your first you. Father's Day, and to all the papas listening out there. Um, that was good. Had a nice dinner with my dad night before that saw a locomotive play out to a draw, which of course we'll get on to. And yeah, it was a nice weekend. How was your first father's day? It was good. It was, uh, it was nice. We spent it out in Chicago with, uh, with my, um, my sisters, my brother-in-law, um, my, my nephew and my new niece, uh, which was, it was nice. We finally got to meet her as well. So, um, yeah, all kinds of cousins. That my sister took this absolutely unhinged video of the three of them. Like, uh, my nephew, my daughter, and I was like holding my niece, uh, <laughs> and they were all making various noise around the table. <laughs> I was just like, Jesus Christ! Like, this is what it's gonna be like uh, for a little bit. But it it is a very funny video where it wasn't them all screaming or crying or anything it was all them chiming in with like their various vocalizations exactly yeah. exactly like them just chiming in um, did you know so... that babies vocalize in their native language what yeah i read something once about how that's a thing like a french baby will vocalize differently than like an american one and it like tracks with their native language even Whoa. though it's like not words. I just thought that was totally insane. not conscious of language as like a concept. Yeah, it's wild. That's crazy. I hope so I didn't it, make that up, but I feel like I read that once in like a, I mean, it, a journal it, of some sort. It feels like it probably is real because they're probably like repeating sounds that they that they hear all the time, or they're like approximating sounds that they hear. <laughs> right. So, so rest assured, all your babies were speaking English in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so no, it was, a, it was a good weekend. Enjoyed the time with the family and uh, did get to take in the locomotive match. And as my, my family's become accustomed to uh, good locomotive match days, um, <laughs> they didn't bat an eye um, at the the uh, late Saturday evening kickoff. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll be talking about the Tampa Bay Rowdies uh, trip to El Paso and and El Paso locomotive coming away with a 1-1 draw. We'll talk about the unbeaten streak, but we really let tonight be about your questions. So listeners sent in a, a bunch of questions and thanks to everyone who did um, via either Twitter or Instagram. We got a bunch of stuff. We have uh, more than we can possibly talk about, actually, in one episode and keeping this comfortably or, you know, somewhat uh, digestible length. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at Seriously Loco. Uh, and every episode, basically, we elicit this sort of, uh, you know, questions or feedback or, uh, you know, thoughts comments smart remarks whatever whatever you uh want to send in and uh so yeah we're kind of letting your questions guide us tonight we will start with the the one one draw between locomotive and tampa bay but we'll also talk a little bit about this this unbeaten streak we'll talk a little bit about um the squad overall we'll talk a little bit about this three match week that we are just coming out of and we'll look ahead a little bit uh, for locomotive because obviously a couple of weeks off, but you know, still plenty uh, to discuss squad stuff, squad news, um, and looking ahead to some of the games um, that are coming up in the near future. So um, with all that being said, if you enjoy uh, what you hear today, we just ask that you, uh, you know, if you want more, you can find us on any major podcast platform um, and you can take whatever, whatever action the platform allows to send uh, you our new episodes and um yeah we'll we'll uh we'll be able to update you from there we'll be here with locomotive stuff all season long um new episodes pretty much weekly and uh i think we've got a couple of ideas about how to fill in the gaps here um haven't done anything formal but we've got some some ideas cooking about how to fill in this little 
break uh, that the team's going on. So, um, yeah, without further ado, I, I mean, Mika, I think we should just launch right into the Seriously Loco match review. Locomotive won, Tampa Bay Rowdies won. Um, we got a question, you know, that kind of sets up the discussion here from um, at Mark Ponce two on Twitter. Uh, our best chances on the night against Tampa Bay really came when Eric, Liam, Nick, or Dennis dribble penetrated past a man to open up what was a really tight midfield. What do you all see from your perspective in terms of final third improvement once we break lines like this? So wanted to talk a little bit uh, about Mark's question. And then we, he's got a second part to the question, which we can get onto here in a little bit. But speaking offensively, obviously a game in which Locomotive created a lot, maybe maybe deserved a little bit more than they got out of this one. But what did you make specifically out of Locomotive's approach um, in this one where most a, a lot of players were um, finding their best success after beating beating their marker um on the dribble which hasn't necessarily been like a hallmark of locomotive this year yeah i mean i think it it says a lot about the opposition that we were playing tampa bay rowdies um obviously you know royalty in the east and they come to the swap for the first time ever and we always knew it was going to be a tight game like this and i think i think tampa bay made their lines very compact and they kind i wouldn't say they pressed in the way that maybe we press where it's like man to man and like we go in packs of like three or four they were more so like camped out all of them like 10 of them in our half and they kind of pressed through dominating space if that makes sense rather than like running at folks and so i think and i think you see that with the way that we went short a lot with benny diaz because we kind of had to because they were you know they were setting that trap so um, I think it necessitated individuals having to take the ball and move through the lines um, because they were keeping it so so compact. And so that's kind of a credit to Tampa Bay. But, um, yeah, I mean, really tough game, really talented opponents. And I guess on the – I guess on the question about final third improvement – um, I mean, I guess I'm not sure, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not reading the question correctly, but I guess I'm not sure what we, if there's any improvement in the final third that like drastically needs to be made because we haven't been shut out in the league since opening night against Sacramento Republic. Uh, we were shut out. The last time we were shut out was in us open cup against union Omaha with a heavily rotated side. I think if I'm not mistaken, we've scored a goal in every single game since and so, and mostly multiple goals. So we're scoring goals. I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think the final third is really a concern. Um, I think not conceded first is maybe a concern. And we did arrest yeah. that against Tampa Bay to be fair. Um, no, we didn't. They did no. score first. So that's they actually, did. that's four in three a row. Straight, uh, three straight. Is I it think, three straight? With, uh, I think, let me, let me double check that. I'll get our interns on it. Um, <laughs> But it, uh, let's see, Birmingham. Oh well, yeah, three straight because we we stopped a skid because we did we kept a clean sheet against New Mexico United. So three straight, um, got it. So three straight, but four out of five because Birmingham we also conceded first. So I think yeah. that's why I was thinking it felt like more. Um, yeah, and we did end up coming back against Birmingham. So yes, I think that is more pressing if you will is the conceding first um and i suppose that comes from either focusing <laughs> like more in the uh, early stages of the game or scoring first ourselves right um but yeah so final third improvement i mean i guess i don't know what what more we could be doing other than scoring boatloads but i mean you know it's soccer and it's a low scoring game by by default so um hopefully that's answered the question somewhat at least yeah, I think I, I think there's probably in this one at least there's maybe a conversion rate conversation um in hey like out of the chances we created. I think particularly with the quality of the of a couple of the chances in the first half, the Mark Navarro chance uh to score the opener, you know, it kind of 
sticks out and maybe maybe it's not so much final third improvement overall but more so like capitalizing on those sorts of moments and big big opportunities um for sure that that is fair i think we were maybe maybe wasteful. timely score maybe timely yeah. scoring even is the is the thought because yeah i mean volume wise i i think you're spot on mika that we like absolutely don't have an issue there mm-hmm. um but i do think maybe there's a maybe there is a something to be said for like some of these early chances that we've kind of left left on the table um there might be something to say like hey does the chance come too early and we're not really ready mentally you know for that that early chance like, whereas like mark our, navarro in the third minute right yeah yeah that's the Fair one enough. that's the one that like sticks out big time is like that's a tap in um especially for a player of his quality like obviously not a forward not you know not a goal scorer um but he's like eight yards out with the whole net to shoot at you know and he just blazes over kind of snatches at it i think so yep. so that's sort of that sort of thing um but to get to to the second part of Mark's question, he said, or it, it really, he just said, also, can we get some appreciation on the quality of the Tampa Bay game? From both sides, this is a fantastic match, well fought, patient, tactical, and bursts of speed that blew it wide open, at which point either team could have conceded multiple goals. I mean, Mika, from a from an entertainment perspective, obviously, when you're watching the game, tough to tough to eliminate the emotion from it. Um but you have to say one of the, one of those matches that very even, well fought as as Mark said, and one of those that um, just a fascinating battle throughout, and and really kind of underlined the quality of of both of these sides. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we spoke last time, Phil, about how you know I said San Antonio is probably the most direct, most imposing. Uh, force that we faced but I think Tampa Bay might be the best footballing side that we've faced I think Neil Collins who's been there for quite a while has you know instilled kind of his his philosophy and it really seems like every player on the pitch knows what they're doing helps to have some continuity in the personnel they've brought back Forrest Lasso Jake LaCava players like that um and yeah they're they're just a very good side they did dominate the ball they did get more shots than us if I'm not mistaken like something like 14 shots am I making that up no we had more shots excuse me but they they didn't have a lot 10 (laughs) yeah so um yeah and you know big chances big chances missed that's all even um and yeah I just think that they're a very good side um and the fitness of their side is really something I mean would not have minded if they randomly tested Spalding because he was still sprinting <laughs> at the end of the game. Ryan Spalding was, and you can't miss him with that hair. No. Um, and he was creating a lot of chances. Jake LaCava was an absolute menace in the second half, kept getting between uh, Mark Navarro and Eric McHugh with relative ease. And I think, you know, if not for Benny Diaz, this might be a bit more of a, of a lashing really than we deserved. Um, but you know, on the flip side, Connor Sparrow made some really insane saves as well. I mean, the the Sanupe, like, is it Sanupe who, like, kind of glances it off his foot? It goes the other way, and Sparrow dives to the far post and, and just just with the fingertips keeps it out. It's an incredible save. So, I mean, yeah, yeah like, to, to Mark's point, just a whole lot of quality on display um, from two sides that, that like to have the ball and like to play, quote, the right way, if you will. Right. Yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, you look down the stat line as you mentioned. It's like uh, El Paso had a little bit. Actually, ended up with a little bit more of the ball, but the uh, um, shots on target six apiece. Both goalkeepers make five saves, which obviously is season high significant. Yeah, for Benny Diaz, <laughs> that is a season high. Yeah, yeah, and and an, and a good performance from Connor Sparrow as well. Um, and. Uh, fouls exactly even 11 to 11 um interceptions six to six like there's just a lot of yeah these teams having having a mutual respect playing playing in a way that i think did cancel each other out in some of the or cancel out some of the the biggest contributors but it did it did give other people a chance to shine and i think um 
you mentioned, I mean, the impact and we, we will talk about some other stuff, but, um, I mean, you talked about the impact of like Manny, um, off the bench. He, he's a whisker away from scoring the winner in this one. Um, Chris Garcia and, uh, too had a bunch of yeah, like really good one-on-one -on -one moments, like just, uh, yeah. One, at one point he makes one dribble, he gets past his man and makes the completely wrong decision to shoot when Manny Sinope is wide open for an empty netter. Um, yeah. and then the next time he gets past his man again to, to the goal line and the, the, uh, cutback is blocked. So yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of really good performances off the bench as well. Just not quite that like killer touch. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a match that I, I thought, um, really well played probably one of, you know, for the neutral, like one of the best watches of the weekend. If you're, if you're into the tactical battle, um, and Claire Hout again, you know, holding his own against against a seasoned USL, like a proven um, USL mind in Neil Collins. He's got tons of success with Rowdies and uh, and has proven, you know, time and again that he's among the best managers in USL. And Claire Hout again, keeping keeping pace um, and and coming away with a credi creditable result. Although I will say, you know, drawing at home, and this is this gets into uh at Der Schattenwolf uh on Twitter. Um he said, you know, playing against Tampa is always a tough game. Just ask my Toros. Um do you feel like you won or or lost? Does it feel like you know a draw is a win? We talked about uh following the San Antonio match like this is probably a, a draw that feels like a win. Does this feel like a like a is this a draw that feels like a win or lost two points looking back? Um on on your games and why so i mean did this feel like a good draw or did this feel like two points left on the table maybe i think this is a draw that is fair to both sides um i think either side could have scored two or three more goals depending on the um chances that you look at i i i don't consider it i mean of course mathematically it is two points dropped right but I just think this is a fair result and, you know, game three of a three game week, like no, you know, Brian Claire Howard and his staff are not going to be making excuses, but we absolutely can make excuses for the team <laughs> yeah. as fans were allowed. And, you know, I wouldn't blame them for being a little bit tired, you know, and I think that is, it's impressive that they were able to, um, it sounds worse on paper than it is, but get five points from nine in a three game week. And this is, not our last three game week of the season for God knows what reasons, but um, still to not lose at all with that much uh, travel and mm -hmm. um, just no time really to like fully train or look at video. I think it's impressive what we've done this week and we've kept our, our streak going. So it kind of feels like when we do lose, it'll be devastating. Cause it's like, what's that? <laughs> Right. We've been very spoiled <laughs> ever since Detroit. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm of the opinion that this is a fair draw. And actually the XG is so close, depending where you look, but El Paso Locomotive FC one point six nine expected goals to Tampa's one point six six. So I mean yeah. you know, I think it's extremely <laughs> fair. Yeah. Rounding down 1-1 one, one is fair, rounding up 2-2 two, two is fair. So it's like one of those Precisely. things where, yeah, <laughs> where it's like either way you slice it, a uh, draw was probably the re the fair result based on the underlying numbers, based on the eye test even too. I will say there's probably a couple of moments in this game that for Locomotive feel like, ah, like that was it, you know, like that yeah. was the three points right there. And this team has... This team has, you know, capitalized on a lot of those moments in this 12 match unbeaten run of which, you know, however many nine of them were wins or something like that. So it's like, you know, uh, they've they've been able to capitalize in so many of those. I think looking back on this week, to your point, Mika, going to San Antonio and getting a draw, getting the win, you know, of the three games, the game that 
was a must win was Vegas. And while they maybe made it a little bit more difficult than it should have been, they got the three points against Vegas. And then you play Tampa Bay, like at the end of that stretch, certainly not the order in which you would have wanted to play those three games. Certainly not like necessarily, um, you know, the circumstances that you would have wanted to play Tampa Bay in. Um, but yeah, to come out of that week with two draws against two of the best teams in the league, um, one of which was on the road and, uh, yeah, to cap off a, a three game week with a draw against rowdies, I don't think is, is a bad point at all. Um, normally I'd be more disappointed, I think in a, in a home draw, but against that sort of opposition, um, and on the night with both teams being so even, like I absolutely will come away, you know, as a locomotive fan head held high saying like, Hey, any team on any night, like we can hang with this. Wasn't, this wasn't wow. We like clung to a one, one draw. We played rowdies at their game and absolutely hung with them, which, you know, I think is further demonstration that this locomotive side can, can beat anybody in the league and can hang with anybody in the league on their own merit. So, um, so I mean, 12 games undefeated Mika this, as you said, it is kind of like what is losing, and I know that <laughs> might it. It seems almost ridiculous given this how the season started out with the three straight losses. But I mean, it's it. it there, I guess it reaches a certain point where twelve games unbeaten starts to feel not just like something that we're enjoying, but also something that the players are using to fuel what is you know a a very positive like locker room atmosphere right now where they go into every match assuming that they're going to get a result like rather than hoping that they're going to get a result yeah absolutely i mean uh we've been we've been able to get some of some insight into what goes on in the dressing room with locomotive posting a lot of really good content of brian giving some of his pregame talks obviously doesn't want to give all of that away but from what we can see I mean the guy's absolutely a a fine motivator you know and what he told the boys before this game is we don't let this slip right so I mean standards are set he's challenging everyone in the room to meet them a lot of uh, players have come in and out of this side right I mean we didn't we'll talk on this later I'm sure when, when we get to listener questions but I mean Nick Hines comes in after being solely a role player since Detroit right and yeah pretty much I think performs admirably (laughs) we'll talk about it but you know it's just that mentality of like anyone could come in and we expect you to perform we've seen that as well with Navarro and Lions kind of trading minutes here and there um and so it's it's just really impressive and you know maybe Maybe there's a little bit of fatigue setting in because the last three, you know, of the of this 12 game run does have two draws in it. Where before that we were, what seven games win win streak. So mm-hmm. you know you could be forgiven for for thinking that it's starting to slip a little bit. But it's it's just really amazing to see how we've turned we've really turned it around from where we started and we, we figured that would be the case, right? Cause yeah. three games in a week to start the season is just stupid. Uh, and yeah. I'll, I'll still be saying this in October and November when we're lifting the trophy. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I think I, and I think it's like, it's worth mentioning that we are in like rarefied air right now. And for all, for all, you know, for all the concerns and like what we'll talk about, uh, like we're still going to talk on the podcast about, Hey, here's an area, like here are areas where locomotive could be better. Here's where, Hey, this goal was like crappy to concede or whatever, which I, the opener in this, (laughs) in the Tampa Bay game that hurt a lot to concede from like just a straight up rebound. Um, right given how good Benny has been and, you know, how good locomotive have been at kind of neutralizing those sort of obvious or easy chances. Um, we'll still have the criticisms and it's really like what locomotive do- are doing right now is really, really uncommon for this level. Um, 
you know, we're talking about a, a we were talking about a Sacramento Republic team that we were like, this team is just like unbelievable. They just figure it out. They find a way to get it done. I mean, they lose to Monterey, right? Which can happen. Like anybody can lose to Monterey, but that's, I guess the point I'm making is like anybody can lose to anybody in this league. So the fact that locomotive have not lost in 12 games is significantly like it's a significant achievement and Absolutely. not something that you see all the time in this league. And the fact that, I mean, we joked about whatever the mentality monsters down in San Antonio, but the fact like to be able to keep this run up, fight through the physical and mental, you know, uh, barriers to performance and continued performance and not slipping at any point during this run is just um, such a credit to the staff and the team. Cause they've, they've just been such, such professionals and shown up like with, Hey, every single game is its own challenge. Every single game is its own. Um, you know, I think it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason of like, you know, you heard it. So you hear it so much at the top level of like, we're just trying to win the next game. And uh, that is that is what this team has been able to do in terms of they've just looked at that next game as a new challenge, a new chance to prove themselves. And um, and so far, they've they've really held up their end of the bargain and they get a much a much uh, deserved little little break here as a squad, um, getting some some legitimate time off Um and a little break from like media availability, all that sort of stuff, uh, and training, and getting a chance to unwind a little bit as a uh, as a team, and maybe refuel the batteries a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. No, you make you make a great point about how weird this is in USL because, yeah, I mean, it's so hard to put together form in this league because you just never know what's going to happen. I mean look at the east right charleston battery they're they're supposedly like our counterpart in the east first place and they've got in their last five they've dropped points in three you know two losses and a draw and that's that's the best in class in the east question mark i mean maybe pittsburgh riverhounds are making a case for that because they've got the game in hand but like yeah it's just amazing what what locomotive have been able to do in in a conference that we think I think we've said this many times. We think it is the better of the two and to be top of that pack and then top of the league on top of that. I mean, chapeau, <laughs> chapeau yeah. to, to Brian Clairhout and his staff. And of course the boys and yeah, these two weeks are hopefully going to be very restful. I mean, sources say a lot of these boys are in Cancun, so fair play. <laughs> like, <laughs> they certainly deserve it. Um, yep. Just wear sunblock, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's incredible. And, and, you know, I think we tweeted it a couple days ago. Like, you have to enjoy the good times while they're here. Mm -hmm. And I think it can get, we can get caught up in like, what's next? What's next? Well, like, what about what's right now? Right? We go into yep. two weeks, a break until the Derby at home and we're top of the West. Yeah. What a, what a place to be in. Right. So enjoy it. Locomotive fans. That's all I have to say. Yeah. 12 games unbeaten from what I can tell. And I can't, I'm not finding the stats on this. I would need to need to find someone a little bit deeper in the, uh, in the USL stat lines. Um, John, Morrissey, but I mean, where you at? <laughs> but it's approaching it's a like it's approaching like a top 10 like ever undefeated streak um Richmond kickers have the record 22 games unbeaten which that is going to be tough to tough to touch um back when they were in old USL pro um but but yeah, this is this is a rare time, um, and we are watching we are watching a team at the absolute peak peak of its powers right now, and uh, it'll be exciting to see how long they can keep it going for, and you know what it means for the rest of the season. But we got a lot of questions, like we mentioned, and uh, Mika, I think it's it's time we we about dived into the listener mailbag. Seriously, loco listener questions. I guess I can I can throw this one to you um, because 
there's one question <laughs> that permeated uh, the mailbag. And these are just two of the people who asked about it, but we've gotten several questions about this over the last few weeks. Um, it has been the hot topic in terms of whenever we ask for listener questions. So, um, so we had two questions um, about Patar Petrovich. Uh, the first from at SG Contulis on Twitter. How much longer is Petrovich supposed to be out for? Um, and what, and then at some guy, Chris on Twitter, when is Petrovich back? Question mark, exclamation point. So <laughs> we'll start there. There's more to Steve's question, which we can get to in a second. But, um, but of the two, when is Petrovich back? Um, how much longer is Petrovich supposed to be out? Mika, do we know anything about Petar Petrovich and what's going on? Yeah. I, like I tweeted the other day, we are not trying to ignore this. We just were trying to find out what's going on. And we don't know everything and we won't claim to know everything, but they've been keeping this under wraps to be fair. Like this has been true. Closely true. guarded. Despite our best journalistic efforts. <laughs> <laughs> so no clue when he'll be back. I mean, it does seem like he is doing everything he can to be back on the pitch as soon as possible. Um, it was put to us that he tore the labrum in his hip. Um, now, I'm not a doctor. Phil's not a doctor. Christian's not a nope. doctor. So we can only tell you that's what happened. It seems like there's conflicting views um, in the medical field about whether such an injury requires surgery or not. Um, and it's also kind of been put to us that perhaps Petar is looking for a second opinion. Um, so I think that is part of why he's not been as visible, even though he's been injured. Whereas Yuma who has been injured has still been visible at the swap and, you know, with fans and stuff. I mean, Petar, we did see Petar at the Derby, uh, in Albuquerque. But then after that, I think he had, uh, gone somewhere to, to get that second opinion. So that's, what's going on. He's still injured. No timetable for his return. Not because we don't want to share it, but because we genuinely don't know, yeah. Uh, and it would be not cool of us to speculate much further than that. But the injury does seem significant enough that he wants another uh, thought on it. So I think that's fair enough. Um, yeah. You know, it's I don't know how serious a, a, a labrum tear is. It sounds painful, <laughs> but right. um, hopefully it's not anything that will keep him out for the rest of the season. But obviously, you know, we'll see. Um you know, the guy loves to play, so I'm sure it's killing him not to be on the pitch right now, especially because he was getting into some good form. So yeah. um, that is as much as we know on the Swede. So, yeah. Yeah. The only the only experience I can even claim to have on that is like orthopedic surgery. There are a lot of different opinions about a variety of different conditions and the decision to like operate or not operate on a given condition or a given, like a, a given tear, a given whatever mm -hmm. opinions do vary wildly, like across right. different surgeons, um, in terms of like whether or not to operate. So yeah, for the individual, like if you feel like the opinion isn't, you know, just like any of us, we, <laughs> Pizarro has the right to, you know, figure out what's best for him and, and take that approach and hopefully you know whichever he does pick sets him up for success in the long run he is a player that unfortunately has had some significant injuries in his career which set him back in um in sweden and so it is you know it's always difficult to see a player struggle um for fitness when that's been like part of their story and so hopefully patar can get back quickly because we all know the the quality that he brings um, to the side. I mean, I think in terms of just raw talent, he is probably one of the best players that's ever played for Locomotive. Yeah. Um, just in terms of like technical ability and and uh, and vision, all that stuff, he is probably one of the one of the best to ever take the field at the swap. Um, but obviously, has to get healthy before he can continue to show us what he can do. But. Absolutely. Um, the other, the other part of of uh, Steve's question here at SG Contulis, uh, the point that he was making uh, was 
along the lines of like when is Petrovic going to be back? Hines looked very out of place in his position on Saturday. We need a winger who's not afraid to challenge a defender. Maybe Garcia starting in that role. Mika, I guess the broader question here is like Nick Hines. Um, he did he did uh, like stand in essentially like on that left wing um, for for Patar. Um, we've seen a handful of people used in that position. Um, Josue Aron Gomez has played on the left. Uh, Emmanuel Sanupe has played on the left. Chris Garcia has played on the left. And and Nick Hines filled in in this case. So I guess first and foremost is, did you know, did he look out of place uh, in, in that position on Saturday? I suppose he looked out of place in so far as he's a left back being pushed up to left wing, right? I mean... I guess, you know, they are very different positions. They require very different things, despite being on the same side of the field. I don't want to um, oversimplify, like, you're just moving up a couple yards. No, it's really not that simple. So I suppose I can see that point. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of want to come out and defend Nick Hines a little bit because I've seen a lot of talk about, like, we need Petrovic back and, like, Hines this, Hines that. And, like, by all means, like everyone's entitled to their opinion. The eye test might tell you something different than my eye test. And that's the beauty of the game is that we can all kind of talk about it and say why we agree or disagree. Luckily for me, though, I do have this platform <laughs> with Phil called Serious <laughs> Loco where I can talk about how I feel about this. And I think this is something... Well, first of all, I want to say on the basis of that 13-minute cameo in San Antonio, I think Nick does deserve to play. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that he did well enough to show the coach, like, you should consider me again. We're having yep. a bit of an injury crisis. It's a three game week. I'm useful. Fair enough. I think he, I think he deserves a start, you know, and, and maybe Brian's forced into that a little bit by some of the availability issues and what have you. But even so, just on the basis of, of Nick's play in that short amount of time, I thought it was not. Indef you know, indefensible or anything like that. Um, and yes, Nick did start the season not as well as he would have liked, I think. I think we all saw kind of he would bomb on from that left back position and maybe not track back or like realize the space that was left behind him that maybe his teammates weren't filling or that he wasn't communicating well enough about. And maybe in doing that, he wasn't justifying it with like offensive product necessarily that you get from, say, an Ed or Borelli. Right. So I do get that. However, <laughs> I think we're also falling maybe a little bit into a, I don't know if you want to call it like a trope or something like as an Arsenal fan, Arsenal fans do this a lot where like injured players become more world-class the longer they're injured. <laughs> And yep. I don't know if this is like if this happens in like Liverpool fandom or anything, but like I see a little bit of that here where like Petrovic... I mean, I still contend that Daniel Sturridge would have been a would have been a Ballon d'Or winner if not for the injuries. <laughs> um so right. Right. but no, that doesn't to answer your question, no, that doesn't happen in the Liverpool fandom. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So I, I think we're like maybe there's a bit of that where it's like, well, the longer Petrovic is unavailable the more we think of like what he did do and we want more of that and anyone standing in his place is just not up to it right that riverhounds goal just is the only thing i remember <laughs> well he starts like that he helps start this 12 game unbeaten streak arguably with his goal in louisville so like yeah. i get it i absolutely get it i miss him too dearly yep but I just thought Hines was absolutely fine against Tampa Bay. I really did. Like, maybe I'll watch it back and see what, what some of the folks that, that commented on him are talking about. But, I mean, let's just talk stats. Four out of four successful dribbles. 95% pass accuracy. So he misplaced one pass. Yep. Five, and, you know, five recoveries. Six out of seven ground duels won. Dispossessed only once. Sure, there's an argument that these stats are befitting of a left back, maybe not a left winger. And so the point that folks are making about, like, it's not as penetrative in the final third, I can definitely see that. Um, But as cover on the left wing, like, I really don't think it's a disaster by any means. I mean, 
and in fact, like with Borelli behind him, I think it masks a lot of Nick's deficiencies, if you will, um, in terms of like minding the space behind him and, and, um, you know, having to be the only thrust on that side of the pitch. So I don't know. Um, and, and to be fair, like not trying to hound on the question asker at all. Cause a lot of people said this, but there was a lot of comments about Nick should take his guy on more. And it's like, well, what do you mean? Cause he's left footed. He's not nearly as two footed as Petar is his taking a guy on for him would be knocking the ball past him and crossing. And I think he did try that. So, but if you're expecting him to cut inside, like that's just not going to happen. Um, or at least not nearly with the frequency or the success that we might expect like Petrovic to do right um and so he did have that one shot with his right foot that was very tame he should have done better uh but that's him right but I think as cover as like rotation option and start here and there like I just think he's absolutely fine so anyway that's that's my soapbox I think Nick is a fine player and I think you know, once we get Petar back, like he probably reclaims that space right away. But I just wanted to put that out there. I just, I guess I didn't see the, the criticism against Tampa yeah. Bay. I definitely see the criticism in the first three games of the season, but for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think unfortunately like Nick, Nick is uh like one of his two shots that he does, he does put both on target, right? Like he, he, cha- he challenges, Connor Sparrow in both instances there is an argument to be made that he should be doing better with those chances but there's also the mitigating circumstance that he is not he's a not forward our starting fo- <laughs> he's not a forward. yeah he's not a forward um like he I think he absolutely should do better with the first chance I think the second chance maybe is a little bit tougher but but the bottom line is that he's a goal from being the man of the match like by a distance um Okay. Like if he scores either of those, every rating system has him at eight or above, like given the fact that, cause those stats, I, I looked back at, so Patar in his last match that he played, which was the three, two win over Colorado Springs in which he did score mm-hmm. his stat line. Now he scores. So it like, Boost. so we'll take, yeah. but taking the goal out of it, like, which I know it might sound weird, but taking the goal out of it, 13, for, 13 out of 15 passing, uh, three out of three shots on target, two out of two for four successful dribbles, no successful crosses, one accurate long ball, um, one recovery, four out of six on gr- ground duels. So, like, very... I mean, a little less than what Nick did in terms of like in the like underlying stats or in those other kind of auxiliary stats. Yeah. And the real and the real difference being and what we know about Pitar is that he brings he does bring a finishing edge like he brings a a kind of ruthless edge off that wing. And and Nick is not that same guy, which like they're just not they're just not the same player in that way. So. I think if you, you know, if you bring a valid criticism to to the table of Nick and say, "Hey, I think you should do better with these chances regardless of the fact that he's, you know, a left back play uh, you know, ostensibly a left back playing left wing." I think that's totally fair to say he was like poor or like the amount of like calls for Hein should be the first like sub or something like that. He was he performed quite well, I thought, like off that left wing and gave locomotive. I mean, Nick's like X factor on that left wing is he is absolutely faster than every single person on the pitch. Like I put him <laughs> in a foot race against anybody. Mm. Um, and he often turns those moments into something. Now, I think the one criticism you can have of him is you are left it's the end product that that isn't quite there. Um, I mean, this was like a running meme on Seriously Loco last season of like Nick Hines should have ten assists. Everyone's yeah. letting him down. <laughs> like I, yeah. I remember that clear I was, as day. 
I was convinced <laughs> at a certain point in the season that Josue Aron Gomez was like missing on purpose because he had some <laughs> vendetta. Because um, he just simply, if Nick Hines played the pass, like he wasn't going to score. Um, and uh, he, no matter how on a plate it was. Um, and obviously that's all, that's all being completely facetious, but the, the right. reality here is I think, I think Nick is a little hard done by in that I thought he performed, I thought he performed admirably. And in the end, the literally the only thing missing from a very complete performance would have been finishing either of those chances, in which case we're talking about Nick Hines hero, like mm -hmm. match winner, you know? Um, and look at this incredible stat line. And at the end of the day, like, I don't think not having those goals makes him scapegoat villain, like guy who should have come off first or something like that. And I'm not saying that Steve is like saying that here no. and I get his point about, you know, and maybe there is an argument to say like, Hey, if Pitar is in there, we score those two chances and it's like, yeah, fair enough. But there's a lot of variables that you can take into this. And at the end of the day, what Nick could control, he did He did well. Um, and really, it was only those couple of chances that you could maybe say he should have done better. And maybe, maybe Steve has a point about maybe Garcia could be looked at in that role. I think... I think we have given Garcia a lot of chances, and, and sometimes he can be absolutely superb. Other times, he'll sub on and be running like he's been playing for 60 minutes already, like... Sometimes it takes him, I think, a little bit to get up to speed. But once he did, for example, against Tampa Bay uh, on Saturday, he was taking people apart. But I think that's what's so great about him is that against tired legs, he can make certain def defenders look foolish. Whereas maybe right. if he's starting, we don't see that same impact. And by all means, like I'm willing to see it. I'm willing to try it. I'm just speculating that that might be why Chris is kind of an impact sub because he's very good at it. And I think yeah. he's been very good at it since he joined us, really. I mean, I think about one of his very first games against New Mexico United, helping us kill the game. Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, no, I have no objection on, on any uh, level about, like, trying other people in that role. I just think, like, Nick was fine. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and I think if you're, if you're going to go out there and expect more than what Nick gave you on Saturday of any – of the potential replacements your expectations are like through the roof because you're <laughs> expecting basically like an eight out of ten out of a guy who like is a backup mm. right like for right. Pitar. so that is you know is a depth option so anyways yeah, yeah. no but but good question because i think I think it's good. I think it's good. Clearly, have... there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to dis dissect here. So it is a yeah. good question for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's good to have these discussions because that means we're paying attention, right? If we can, if we can talk and disagree respectfully and whatnot. But thank you for the question, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so we had another question on injuries at Alex eight three nine on Instagram said. What is the status of Yuma when he returns? Where does McHugh move? So this is this is a tough one. So what is the status of Yuma? I don't know if we know that either. Um, I mean, he's been, he's I, I guess been around have, the place. Um, he yeah. was announced as injured May 30th, May 31st. And from there, Brian Clairhout said he expected him to miss about a month. So we might be coming up on like healed yuma question mark we might we might see him back on the bench maybe in these next by the time we face new mexico on the first um the i think the bigger part of this question is the second half like when he returns where does McHugh move um i <laughs> this may be controversial but I think Yuma has a work cut out for him getting back into the starting lineup and that is absolutely no disrespect to the captain of the team this is absolutely all about how good Eric McHugh has been. Mm -hmm. um, goal scorer against Las Vegas. Uh, but that aside, like his defensive performances alongside Ben St. Pavkovitz, he's, he's been, I mean, I think you used this term last week, Mika, but he's been a revelation. Um, yeah. He's been, he's been unbelievable. Um, 
the, you know, the spiritual successor to Andrew Fox that we were all hoping for. Um, he absolutely is that guy, uh, like a dominating presence in the box, a uh, someone who just deals with danger and cultured passer, um, like good with the ball at his feet, makes good decisions um, and a danger, you know, now showing himself to be a danger on set pieces at the other end too. So that is, I don't know, to me, McHugh is the complete package and Yuma again, absolutely no disrespect to the, the captain of the team, but um, I don't think Brian has any reason to break up the partnership that, that Pavkovitz and, and McHugh have formed. Yeah. It's, it's always, it's always tough when, you know, you're spoiled for choice. I think that's a good problem yeah. to have. And I think Brian would rather have this problem than not, right? Um, I think where does McHugh move if he wants to stay in the team to another level, maybe? But even if he doesn't, <laughs> uh, there's zero reason to drop him. I think him and Pavkovitz, we've talked about it kind of ad nauseum at this point. But I think that they complement each other very well. Um with McHugh being that stopper, as you said, um, good timing, um, a, a, a unit, right. Whereas Ben say is a bit more like reactive, uh, willing to like make runs and things like that. So, um, yeah, I just, I just really love this partnership and it's, it's not, it's not easy to come in for a figure like that in Yuma, right? Because he's such a huge, character um and i mean that like as a player and as a personality and what he means to this team and to el paso right so for me to come in and do what he's done i mean just insane insane mentality from this player on top of you know the actual football skills that we're seeing so yeah um it's it's a good problem to have that we have to be like well who makes way and it's like does Ben say make way because I don't I mean I think <laughs> left center back is is suits him down to the ground right uh, so and this is the first time correct me if I'm wrong Phil in is it years that someone's like unseated Yuma at center back he's had many partners but mm -hmm. I think it's literally been a couple years. Yeah, basically since he made the switch from central from, mid, yeah. From central midfield. I mean, he yeah. Ever since then he's he's pretty much been ever present aside from maybe a couple of games here and there where he, where he has been injured. Um yeah. So Yeah. It's taken really really interesting storyline to watch though. And and I guess too, you know, what maybe the athletic trainers would would love is that it doesn't really rush Yuma. Not that I think they would, but I mean, right. There's no rush because Eric's performing so well. So yeah, another kind of like plus to a well, probably, situation when someone's injured. So right. And probably just gets them back to a status quo of being able to field like, you know, three center backs of, first team quality and be able to rotate and, and all of that. So, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably, probably just good news, uh, in Yuma's return. Um, we had a couple of questions from at Nick go 11 on Twitter. The first of which, uh, was, um, he said, I feel there's a decently long list, but what tactical changes made by Brian Claire, how this season have really impressed you so far? Mika, we've talked about Brian's ability to adapt um, both for each matchup and then in-game make make adjustments as well. Um, do you have a game or a, or a moment or a certain tweak that, that really sticks out to you as your favorite this year from Brian? It's hard to say like a favorite because I've just been really enjoying watching him like wrap up every other team star player <laughs> um i mean that i guess that's one of them uh he's got an answer for pretty much everyone in this league um that we faced so far um you mentioned it a little bit phil not being afraid to change the shape or and even the personnel in game i mean you saw that in tampa bay where or with tampa bay where we made you know our whole host of changes i think i think neil makes me the collins makes one he brings jake Ehrman on and that's it 
yeah. So, yeah, for Jan Ekra, who was having an absolute hell of a time out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, and <laughs> we didn't even get to talk yet about Dennis Kostichin and his, <laughs> his curler when minutes before that, I will admit, on the record, I was incandescent with rage <laughs> about the shots and the shot selection mm-hmm. of, like please like take like pass the ball stop shooting stop shooting stop shooting oh my god what a goal yeah so you know and and why do i bring that up in in reference to brian and his changes is like brian was ready to hook tennis and he did right after the goal so like yeah um, there's been a couple times where i think you can see in brian's body language that he's like okay he's he's starting to make decisions that are not allowing us to keep the ball. It's time to go. So, and that's just, right. you know, not to single out Dennis, obviously a fantastic goal. The one time he places it, it goes in. I just want more of that instead yeah. of the leathered efforts. But anyway, <laughs> take 20 I, shots, miss, you know, make the 21st. It's fine. Right. I can't, I really can't <laughs> wait for one of those just absolute pile drivers to, for him to roof one of those, like, uh, you know, yeah, the, uh, He's got a foot like a traction engine or whatever. The uh, <laughs> I I just um yeah unbelievable goal. It's a it's a crime we didn't we didn't talk about it sooner. But um but yeah to your point, Dennis Kostichin is maybe one of the best illustrations of Brian's tactical adjustments in that we've seen Dennis play in the same like areas of the field, sort of in about. 10 different deployments uh, uh like in terms of role he's been a deep lying playmaker he's been a winger he's been an advanced forward he's been an advanced playmaker he's been a drifting 10 yep. he's been like you name it like dennis has done it in the side and it it doesn't actually change the shape in the sense that like we still announce 442 he is on the right side of that four four two every single time that we announce the lineup, and yet the way in which he's he's used in each of those is vastly vastly different, um, and he often adapts like so well to those. You know, I think like in terms of in terms of uh, some of these matchups where, you know, I I joked about the the Petrovich goal against Pittsburgh, but that's one that that's a pass that he plays from his own half, you know, very deep lying um, where miles Lyons is actually playing often more advanced than him uh, in attack. And then you think about his involvement in, um, well, in this goal, you know, he's in a, he's sort of drifting off of that right hand side into a more central area. um, And, even yeah some of his i guess other goal involvement like some of the runs he was making against vegas and stuff like he's he's getting wide he's you know making runs in behind um and that to me is what's been so impressive is that brian match to match is able to make those sorts of adjustments with these players and they don't look out of sorts they don't look like they don't understand, you know, the assignment they are, they're going out there and executing, um, which is not an easy thing to do when you're making those sorts of tweaks week in and week out, you know, the areas that you're looking for your teammates in the areas that you're expected to be in all those things like change so much when you make those sort of adjustments and Brian just seems to find a way to, to make it stick, even though he is, you know, tweaking and, and being a little bit more of a, like mad professor um in that way and that he is like he is tinkering with the team um you know quite often but the principles and all of that remain the same which i guess like gives the foundation for the players to execute these uh instructions match match in and match out absolutely yeah we had another one from at nitgo 11 on twitter he said this is probably more of a josue aron gomez appreciation post which Nothing wrong with that. We need more yeah. JAG appreciation posts in our life, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest. But do you think that he is underrated by the league slash media? I always feel like he gives all for the team, can score, and find ways to contribute. I just feel better about our chances when he's in the starting 11. Phil, 
I wax think, poetic on Jack. <laughs> I was gonna say, I I feel like there's probably uh, quite the back catalog of uh, praise for Josue Aron Gomez and the fact that we feel he's pretty underrated uh, in terms of. I mean, by now, I think his his impact is underrated as a you know now five year veteran of locomotive and the fact that he's been across you know across coaches across um across systems he's shown his importance and just what he brings to a side um i think he often unfairly uh or i maybe it's not even unfair he he gets hit with this sort of like workhorse label um Mm. that is absolutely earned in the sense that he will run his socks off. He will work so hard for the team. I mean, in terms of when you need a guy, like we talk about it, when you need someone to go and win fouls to like get you back a a foothold back in a game that's gotten away from you or something like that, he is absolutely that guy. He's street smart. He like, he plays the game well and he is, you know, works and works and works and works and just, you know, the, the work rate is, is unbelievable. But I think it it does it is a little bit unfair in that he is a very high quality goal scorer as well. And uh I think his role has changed this year to where he is in areas more so where he's um being asked to be a provider or press um versus being a volume goal scorer. And yet, you know, he finally kind of showed or got a chance to show um, some of his quality just with, uh, I mean, the chip. Was that? San Antonio. San Antonio. Yeah. I mean. Well, it kind of lobs over the, far and that, then he takes that crazy oh, yeah, the, finish into the empty net. And then, yeah. and then where, where, what was his recent goal? I feel like he has a chip. Um I feel like there was a goal, a, a game recently where he scored. Anyways, he. He's a far more technical player than like what he gets credit for. Um, smart player, and he he will and and should absolutely go down as a a locomotive legend. Um, I mean, five seasons for locomotive until until Lucho, you know, recently <laughs> recently surpassed him. He was the club's record scorer. Um, He's a centurion. Yeah, Centurion. Like, there's so many, there's so many things uh, about Josue Ron Gomez to love, um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think for me, he's he's one of those players that will always, uh, you know, be one of the first that pop to mind when you talk about locomotive. Because I mean, he's 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 a day one, um, and he's, you know, now a bulk of his career has happened (laughs) like his professional career essentially has taken place in locomotive colors and he's he's uh he's made um yeah he's made quite a lot out of you know being the three season loney from bravos he's uh (laughs) he's he's made a lot of it and um and yeah i would say he is a little bit he flies a little bit under the radar outside of el paso but i think i think El Paso locomotive fans who really appreciate those sorts of hard nose like blue collar players uh are I think he get he he is exactly where he needs to be in in that he's amongst a fan base that understands the value that he brings to the team. 100%. Yeah, I I adore Josue Aro Gomez. I think he is he embodies locomotive in a lot of ways um a more of an understated character than say a yuma right but um just as important to the fabric of the of the club and um yeah this is my appreciation post for jags so (laughs) but yeah i mean numbers wise like he's so he's coming into his prime right he's 28 years old so um i suppose you would expect like a bit more end product but i also think he's not being played at center forward the way that he was under Mark Lowry and under John Hutchinson. So naturally he's like you said, Phil, he's facilitating a lot more. Um, and I think a lot of that contribution doesn't necessarily lend itself to attacking stats. Um, but like 
you you also make the point that maybe he gets kind of like pigeonholed as like a workhorse and maybe there's some of that to blame on us because we talk a lot about his his uh work rate but i mean it's because he's one of the best in the game at it and i think it is a skill because he combines that work rate with a really clever football intelligence like he knows when his team is under pressure he knows when the when we need to slow it down a bit when to take a foul you know he's just so so clever and his football iq i think is really underrated and you know we we don't want to overlook his technical skills either because that finish in san antonio is outrageous i know it's into an empty net but a lot of players in this league will miss that um and so yeah i just love josue aron gomez and i absolutely agree with you nick that i feel better when he's in the starting 11 because I, I think his teammates must feel it too that it's like okay there's a little bit of pressure off because like Josue is there you know and mm-hmm. I know he's gonna put in a shift and like you know take the foul if he needs to or play me the ball or protect me link up blah 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 it kind of reminds me like maybe I'm being a little bit dramatic here but it, it popped into my head so I'll say it Lionel Messi used to always say at Barcelona like when things got tough on the pitch I always look for Andres Iniesta mm-hmm. right and like Totally different player, totally different levels, but I just like to think that that's what Josue is like to his yeah. teammates. Like, well, where's Josue? Because, you know, we need a foul. Like, we need to, like, slow the game down. Um, you know, he will use his strength to keep the ball. He's just that kind of guy. And and judging by, like, the way that the, the players interact with him, I think he's super popular in the dressing room. And um, I love him. I adore him. Yeah. Locomotive legend. Um, and... It's just, I feel like it, players like that really make me feel like this club is so worth watching and supporting because, like, he doesn't have to stay here, you right. know? Um, but, yeah, 119 appearances so far, 30 goals, 17 assists. Just a legend, period. Yeah. <laughs> His uh... – now, I will say that this season, probably the safest – the safest like prop bet in USL has become Ederbrelli yellow card and Josue Aron Gomez yellow card. Like <laughs> may as well may as well just bet on it. They are gonna walk away. Cause they are they are those dudes who are gonna get in a scrap and you know, they don't back away from stuff and both of them actually are booked in this one as well. But uh <laughs> um we had uh we had a question talking about the connection to the team and this next question kind of kind of feeds into that talking about El Paso's connection with with the team at at Texas Music Kid on Twitter as he said I heard Brian discussed attendance after Saturday's game we know it was a giveaway but please share your thoughts on how much you believe El Paso has actually bought into this team hard for me to judge because I would be there if we were relegated to <laughs> American youth soccer <laughs> 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 uh, but I mean Mika just on the obviously it was the highest attendance of the year um like over 8000 in attendance to see to see a marquee matchup against Tampa Bay giveaway all that sort of stuff but has you know how has locomotive connected and do you think they've done a good job of maybe reeling back in some of those some of those folks who might have become disconnected over the last year Everyone loves a winner. I mean, we can't get away from that, right? Um, You know, shout out to everyone that did not overreact after first three games because I think it would have been easy to do that considering what we went through last season as well. Um, But, yeah, it's it's really impressive to see the numbers that we pulled on Saturday. Um, 8,121 butts in seats, the largest turnout of the season thus far. Um, and you know, everyone was treated to 12, 12 unbeaten, uh, and a really, really good entertaining football match. I mean, the only thing that would have made it even more perfect is if we got all three points. Um, what I would suggest is to anyone like, like Cody, who's asking this question, um, for anyone who was actually at the game, you might not realize how loud it was because you were caught up in the moment, but go and watch the goal again because the roar from the crowd is just unreal absolutely unreal and you know we play in a baseball stadium it's not like it's shaped for that right we're not like 
it's not like the Westfallen Stadion or something where like the, <laughs> the, the seats are super steep and it's made to like um, trap noise and things like that. But I mean, the roar of the crowd is just absolutely amazing. And yeah, um, yeah, it, w- it was a nice giveaway. To be fair, they were giving away <laughs> first year BLK kits, um, so those are officially like vintage now, which makes me feel absolutely decrepit. But um, <laughs> But yeah, the attendance was spectacular. And you know, attendance is something that I think in US um lower leagues or you know any league below MLS or maybe even at MLS, I don't know, it can be used to as a stick to beat certain teams with. Um and I think even on Wednesday, like it was noticeably less, but it was still respectable. Yeah. Um and so yeah, El Paso's vibing with this team. I think it's better when we win, obviously. Uh but but the vibe is good, I think. I uh, I do love, and I mean, this kind of actually feeds into another question, another question we got um, at Yosh Girls on Instagram. Can you unpack the Brian Clairhout effect and what are reasonable expectations for the rest of the way? I mean, part of the connection to the fan base for me is part of the Brian Clairhout effect, in addition to what he's been able to do on the field, obviously, which 12 unbeaten is is... Uh, an achievement in and of itself, but the style like that they've adopted of, I mean, you mentioned the West, <laughs> the West Fallen Stadion, like um, them going to eighth notch, you know, arm in arm, like the squad, uh, like hand in hand and, and celebrating uh, like results or cheering kind of like giving props to the supporters. The, it's just, we talked about it last season that it did, you know, the vibes, like you said, the El Paso's vibing. Now, last year, the vibes felt a little bit off. Um, the in vibes terms were of... in hell. I'll just, I'll put, <laughs> I'm just gonna put it out there. There, there was not that connection. I mean, and I think it's you know there wasn't as much of an effort made to forge that connection. There wasn't a there. It, it wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't that connection at all. Um, and it does feel so different. So, um. I know that part of that's not really what <laughs> this question is getting at, but like the Brian Claret effect, I think it does extend a little bit beyond the field in that you talked about him as a motivator with the squad. Clearly he's getting a response from a lot of these players in terms of, you know, some of them are playing the best, like the best soccer of their careers mm. um, at the moment. Um he's put together he's he's gotten a group that i mean for the most part was here last year um and gotten them gotten them firing on a level that they certainly you know weren't at that at that point obviously that he added a couple of pieces as well and a couple of key pieces but he's gotten songs out of guys who we maybe were a little bit harsh on um and uh and amongst all that like reforged some of these these connections which had fallen away last year um in terms of giving the supporters that that feeling of connection again and so i think all around you know from a club perspective like brian really has had a tangible impact on kind of all of the things that you would judge a manager and a technical director on yeah 100 percent. i mean Reasonable expectations for the rest of the way. I mean, I think at some point we will lose. I know. <laughs> sit down and <laughs> <What>? <laughs> sit down and kind of accept this. I think that will happen. I don't know that we're going to go like invincible the rest of the way. But I think we'll be able to react to that in a way that has lots of context, right? Of like, yeah. this is a good side. And sometimes it's not your day. Yeah. Um, and I can only assume at some point that will happen. But there's plenty of credit and goodwill in the bank and all of that Brian and John and all the rest of the staff deserve. And the players deserve it too. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, to go kind of back to Cody's question too is how much you believe El Paso is actually bought into this team. I think we also have to, like, recognize there will always be the day trippers and like the casual fans like and that's mm-hmm. fine because right they're like the financial lifeblood of a club like locomotive that relies on you know gate receipts to a large extent and that's okay right and that's that was kind of the our call to action too is like 
bring someone who doesn't even like soccer. It doesn't matter. Like, just go, yep. right? So there's a place in Locomotive for everyone, whether you only watch the World Cup or if you have 5,000 teams that you track on FOTMOB like myself and Phil or, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, if you're somewhere in between. If you only care about Locomotive, that's cool. Like, it's El Paso's club. And so, yeah, from the casuals to the hardcore, like, everyone's everyone's welcome. Yeah. Reasonable expectations the rest of the way you mentioned it. I think like I think enjoying enjoying this run and and seeing it to its end, what you know, whenever that whenever that is. Um but I think like the reasonable expectations probably remain playoffs. And I think it's easy to, it's easy to get carried away seeing locomotive top of the West top of a tough Western conference. Um, I mean, I read it in, we shouted out John Morrissey earlier. I read it in John Morrissey's power rankings uh, on uh, back healed today, him talking about uh, the fact that he's like, there's a strong case to be made that the three best teams in the league are all in the West um, locomotives in that, like they have worked their way into that conversation, which is, I just I I want to put it out there that it's like it is fun to be top. It yeah. is like it is fun to be in a conversation and and um you know you feel like you've got that seat at the table when you're feeling like you're amongst the elite and everything. And like we are top after 15 games, which means absolutely zero. Like that is true. Yeah. That is <laughs> like, true. Be, no one cares who was top after 15 games like that's that isn't anything um so we just have to remember that like it is a long season there's a long way to go enjoy the ride and like the good news is that finishing top in this league doesn't mean anything even if you do finish top <laughs> you still have to win the playoffs so uh Jesus, that's the good news <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's less pressure. No, you're right. You're right. Um, there's less sword. pressure about about finishing top because even if you do, you still got to win some playoff games. So, um, the I think the thing we get to dream about now is a first round by. We get to dream about a home playoff game. You know, setting up like home field advantage. At you know, because every team's dream at the beginning of the season is getting to play a home playoff game you know right. um Seems and better. uh yeah so the idea that that we might um be able to set up some home field advantage that's the that's the dream and there's still a long long way to go and there will be ups and downs along the way so just enjoy the ride i think is the reasonable expectation and you know i think we can comfortably say that making the playoffs is kind of the the minimum expectation still regardless Absolutely. Well said. I guess we can end on sort of a random question, but I just thought we should throw it on there anyway. Sure. At Twisted Beto, Twisted underscore Beto on Twitter says, have y'all watched any, any M-A-S-L? El Paso should have a team. Thoughts. So what's M-A-S-L, Phil? And so, like, what is this? So M-A-S-L, if I'm not mistaken, is the major arena st- soccer league i think or i think it's major is that what it is um yes that's what it yeah yep okay so arena soccer like for those who know i you know for those who know this is like walled indoor soccer um fast pace i think they play quarters instead of halves there's like a whole penalty box thing like it is very different rules from the outdoor you know, from your typical game. But um, it was interesting that this question came across because MASL is, there are a couple of cities where it is really, really popular. Like uh, I know St. Louis ambush are a really like big team. Memphis has a pretty Me- Memphis Americans is a pretty big MASL team. Um, Baltimore, I want to say has a pretty, I think San Diego soccer is like, I've San Diego. Sorry. Yeah. Huge. How could I not mention yeah. San Diego soccer? Is that, that is like, San Diego soccer is basically like single-handedly kept the sport of soccer afloat in America <laughs> through like the dark ages. Um, 
Respect. And so, yeah, MASL uh, has like a pretty long history in the States. And it was always, you know, the idea initially being that soccer couldn't hold the attention span, like the short attention span of Americans. And this like faster paced version of the game can uh, do a better job of like keeping people engaged. It has its own kind of unique culture, unique, uh, obviously, styles of play and stuff like that. So it is always it's always something that struck me as interesting um, in terms of, you know, a lot of like banger goals because everything's so condensed. So people are, you know, trying it's a little things. bit more. akin. Yeah. People just be trying things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so on the note of El Paso having a team, sadly, El Paso did have a team um, that was founded in 2016. So shortly, you know, a couple of, like basically right on the heels of Locomotive um came the El Paso Coyotes and I think the idea was to try to kind of like capitalize on this momentum that Locomotive had made um or well 2016 no it was even before Locomotive yeah yeah it was right before Locomotive that's what it was so it was it was like you know we're going to try they had the County Col- Coliseum as where they were you know set up expanding in the in the MASL and um unfortunately for whatever reason I think some of the stuff that was going on with the Coliseum itself and just I I mean everything that was going on maybe in 1920 uh pretty pretty uh you know consequential years um so yeah, you they mean 2019, they, 2020, right? Yeah, not yeah, 2019, 20, yes. Yeah, 2019, 2020. So yeah, th- so they played uh, their final season in 2018, 2019, um, unfortunately. But they, uh, yeah, they played for, I guess, a couple of seasons and just didn't didn't see it as uh, as viable beyond that. I think probably a a little bit of a COVID casualty. Um, but uh but yeah unfortunately El Paso gave their they kind of gave it a shot I mean certainly not the end of the story uh there's probably a, there's probably something to be said that they could make a comeback or a new MASL franchise could could give it a shot in El Paso but um but yeah it unfortunately didn't work out last time well if Wikipedia is to be believed. The current champions are just a couple hours south of the border in the Chihuahua Savage. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't realize they had uh wow. They do have Mexican franchises. That's insane to me because like the southernmost team is Monterrey, Monterrey right. Flash. But there's teams in like Tacoma, Washington and like Utica, New York. Like that's... <sighs> Wow, that wild. travel is well. I don't know if the I don't know if the conferences play each other, but still, like even from Monterrey to Tacoma is quite a journey, uh, and they're both in the the Western Conference. So yeah, wow. I mean, yeah. If if the Coyotes ever came back, like I'm definitely down to check it out. I've never been to an arena soccer game, but I I imagine I don't know, Phil. You correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine it's like very like futsal like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just not uh, on the main a hard difference, court, be- right? Yeah, it's on like turf, I guess. Uh, okay. And then, um, no, like, out of bounds is obviously like because futsal obviously is played on like uh, like there's an out of bounds and everything. They you like know, there's not. And stuff, this yeah. is like hockey style, like with walls and and everything. <laughs> so, um, nice. So yeah, it just keeps the keeps the pace up, but but yeah, if uh, if El Paso ever decided to get to get back into it, it would certainly be uh, I think worth the worth the watch. And it's unfortunate that it didn't work out. Um, I mean, they have a whole. I'm learning so much. They have a whole uh, higher like hierarchy of MASL. They have all the way down to League Three. Yep. That's really impressive, to be fair. Yeah, there's actually a handful of USL um, USL 
clubs that have um or usl2 i would say Mm -hmm. like that play in the masl nice hierarchy as well so i know muskegon risers i think is one that is um that also plays in um that also plays in usl um and has like outdoor and indoor like distinct teams um as part of the club so there apparently used to be a club called Cuervos de Juarez that played in El Paso as well so I'm just learning all types of things wow (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah some of these teams go all the way back to the 90s like Baltimore Blast were founded in 1992 Milwaukee Wave were founded in 1984 um okay so there are some of these teams that have been around for quite a while damn yeah amazing love that question how does going down the (laughs) rabbit hole so cheers (laughs) yeah so maybe maybe at some point um yeah maybe at some point they'll get back to the games are on twitch apparently so okay so accessible got it yeah Awesome. So, well, I guess that does about wrap us up. Um, We are in for a little bit of a break. Like I said, we've got some ideas cooking about how we could spend um, or content for this little, for this little break we've got going on. So um, July 1st is the next time that locomotive will, will suit up. It is a Derby. It's back in, it's back in the swap. Um, so obviously looking forward to that and then a nice little run of games, um, a lot of wet, you know, we finally kind of get like a string of just Western conference teams. The whole interleague stuff is out the window. We get, uh, we get two games against RGV in a month, uh, which will be a nice, (laughs) that'll be nice. Um, but anyways, we get, we start back with a Derby in a couple weeks time, um, and that'll that'll obviously be a marquee ticket on on the night of July first in El Paso. Hopefully, one that we can again pack the pack the swap for and uh, do some big numbers um, and give the the Derby the atmosphere that it deserves. Um, other than that, um, like I said at the top of the show, you can find us on social media at Seriously Loco. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform. And uh, yeah, hopefully everyone's enjoyed the episode. Um, we'll uh, we'll let you know if uh, our ideas for content during the break work out, and uh, we'll uh, we'll talk to you then. But until then, stay loco.